We continue with our study on the book of Romans. And since the beginning of chapter 2, we talk about uh, hypocrisy. I remember this uh, story of an old woman who called his pastor. Pastor, my pet dog died. And would you please officiate the necrological service for my dog? And the Baptist pastor said, you know, actually he was a stand. We don't do that here, but you can try the church two uh, corners or two blocks away from here. And the woman said, Pastor, uh, can you give me an advice? Uh, I am willing to give a minimum of 10,000 pesos for the necrological service. And the pastor said, oh, hold on. I didn't realize your dog was a Baptist. <laughs> so we can conduct the funeral here. Well, again, we've been talking about hypocrisy and the word hypocrisy originated in the Greek language <coughs> as a theat theatrical term. You see in Greek theater an actor would uh, or often played several roles in just one play by wearing several masks, perhaps two or three. And over the years this Greek word took on negative connotations and eventually it evolved to mean two-faced, describing someone who said one thing and did another. Someone who pretended to be something his or her actions did not back up. You see, Jesus encountered hypocrisy during his earthly ministry, especially in the lives of religious leaders of that day. And whenever he did, he always condemned it severely. In fact, in just one message, he did so no fewer than seven times, denouncing the religious establishment by repeating the same rebuke over and over again, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Unfortunately, these days we still see hypocrisy in spiritual leaders, in church leaders. And the sad fact is, I imagine most of you know of perhaps a pastor or a church leader who said one thing in the pulpit and did another when outside, when out of there. Some like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. But you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that only church leaders are the only ones who allow themselves to be ensnared with hypocritical attitudes or actions. The truth is, all of us, we are all guilty of hypocrisy in one form or another. And if we were really completely honest with ourselves, we'd all have owned up to varying degrees of hypocrisy. Think about it. We tear someone down with our gossip so we can feel superior. But we justify our comments by saying, well, I just shared a prayer item for that person because I want the people to pray for him intelligently. Or perhaps we say something that sounds humble, but our actual intent is prideful. And we want to uh, impress people with our humility. Or we are so often quick to criticize others, but our true motive is not to correct or make things right. As much as it is to be seen and admired for our superior knowledge or superior intelligence. Hypocrisy. And that is what we're going to discuss this morning. And its negative effects on us. But before we continue, let's commit this time to the Lord. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And we ask that the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to help us understand and comprehend, Lord, your word, that we would be convicted, corrected, built up, and scored, encouraged by your truth. Help us, Lord, to apply your word, this truth, in those places where we need the most. We pray that we would not only be hearers, but be doers of the word. Empower me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You still remember at the beginning of Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and I said that the whole section up till, until chapter 3, verse 20, Paul is explaining 
the need for everyone of the gospel. Everybody needs the gospel. And so in chapter 1, verses 18, until the last uh, verse of chapter 1, it talks about the Gentiles. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 16, he talks about the moral Gentiles or the Jews. And now here in our text, verses 17 to 24, he refers to the Jews. This is the first time he used the Jews. And uh, you see, the Jews seem to think that because of the privileges that they have, they are already exempted from the judgment of God. That they don't need the saving grace. And so, what are those privileges? He was the son of Abraham. Unlike the pagans, he had God's law revealed to Moses on the holy mountain. And he was circumcised, again, in contrast to the defiled Gentiles. And these privileges, the Jews think that they are already saved. That they won't be condemned. And so here in our text, Paul mainly focuses on the law. And he exposes the hypocrisy and shows us its devastating effects. Okay, verses, uh, there are three principles, three truths. In verses 17 to 20, we see that hypocrisy misleads the hypocrite. Now these Jews felt that they are already secure before God. Because of their religious heritage. At the outset, we need to understand that this is not a racial attack against the Jews. This is not, uh, Paul was not guilty of being anti-Semitic here because we know that he was a Jew himself. And in fact, he said that he would be willing to spend eternity in hell if it would mean the salvation for the Jews. He loved the Jews. But let us look at their heritage. First, Paul says, you bear the name of the Jews. These people could trace their religious ancestry all the way back to Abraham. And somehow they felt that their lineage is a guarantee, an ironclad guarantee of their salvation. But that is farther from the truth. You see, when Jesus confronted the Jews of being enslaved to sin, they pointed to that fact. They pointed to that fact that they were children of Abraham and even made the ridiculous statement, we have never been enslaved to sin. And Paul is saying you take pride in that, you are so confident in that, in the fact that you have a unique relationship with God, that God has chosen you, that God has elected you. And Paul is raising here the problem or the misapplication of uh, the doctrine of election, the national uh, election of Israel. And the people of Israel are telling Paul, Paul, we don't need your gospel because we are the chosen people. And out of the nations of the earth, he chose us, God chose us. Your gospel is okay, but we don't need it. We are his people, we won't be condemned. And the apostle Paul is saying, you are misled. That is a misapplication of the doctrine of individual or divine election. And Paul in this book of Romans gives us two arguments <coughs> against the misapplication of the doctrine of divine election. First, the proper results and effects of election. Paul says, if you are truly chosen, if you are truly elected, then it must be seen in your life. You should have been transformed. If there is no transformation, you are deluded. That's what Paul is saying. If you have not been changed, your life hasn't been changed, you cannot claim that you are really an elect. And then the individual election of God that we see when we study chapters 9 to 11. Alongside the truth of their national election as the people of God, you need to recognize, Paul says, there is another important truth and that is the individual or the doctrine of the individual election of God. And he quotes, you remember Jacob, have I loved, and Esau, have I hated. He points to two Jews. One is chosen, the other one is not. 
One is of God's people, the other one is not. One is blessed, the other one is not. And they are two true sons of Abraham. And Paul is saying here, so that you will not think that because of the special relationship, because of your election, then you are not condemned anymore. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Paul's words to the Jewish people of his day are still applicable to us today. And millions of people, since the start of Christianity, believe and they are saying that they are Christians because they were born of Christian parents. They, were, they have uh, uh, Christian law law and law laws. They have received a great favor of the teaching of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, they are surrounded by Christian things. They heard the gospel. They heard the word of God. Read, taught, and preached. But the problem is, their lives have never been changed. No love for God and His word. No hatred of sin. No growth in holiness. They still talk and act and dress like the world. And possible, perhaps, because of those things, the privileges that they had, they grew up in a Christian home, they would think, that they are already saved, they are automatically, that makes them a Christian. They become so proud of that. Proud that they are elected. Do you know that that is a contradiction in terms? Because you have nothing to your account to credit for your election. You know, even Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 7, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I have chosen you not because you are the greatest of the people, but in fact, you are the least of them. I have chosen you because I love you. In other words, the reason, the origin, the source of God's choosing of his people is not to be found in them. Or anything that they've done. Or anything that they are. But it is to be found in the mercy of God. And the same is true today. You can be proud. Or you can be a Christian, but you cannot be both. How can you be proud of being saved by the grace of God? How can you be proud that you have been chosen only on the basis of the mercy of God and the merits of Jesus Christ and not of your own? Is there something to be proud about that? Actually, it humbles you to realize, brothers and sisters in Christ, for some reason, God in His mercy has chosen you, has saved you, despite of your filthiness, despite of our being dirty, and we are adopted and brought into the kingdom of God. Isn't that the most humbling experience? Lord, why, you ha why have you chosen me as a guest? Why have you invited me in your banquet? I cannot commend myself to you. There are uh, more people, men and women, who are more moral than me, who are more deserving than me. But in your mercy, you have chosen me. Isn't that humbling? It humbles us to the dust. Knowing that God chose us in spite of our sin should humble us and cause us to glorify Him for His mercy and love. And Paul is saying that the people of his day, the Jewish people, have distorted, have contorted the truth that they become proud of being chosen, chosen as a people of God. The second thing is the law. Paul says they rely upon the law. The Jews somehow felt that the law and its rituals gave them a higher standing in the eyes of the Lord. They felt that just by knowing the law, possessing the law, enough, it was already enough for them to have a right relationship with God. And Paul will tell them before he is true that it is the knowledge of the law that holds them to a higher standard than those who do not know the law. What they thought was a guarantee of salvation turned out to be a guarantee of condemnation. So when Paul says you rely upon the law, he's again responding to, to them the, who are saying, well, Paul, 
we don't need your grace. We don't need the grace. It's nice, but we have the law. We won't be condemned. And Paul says, fine. You see, Paul didn't contradict, contradict them. Paul said, okay, fine, you have the law. Do you do it? You have the law. Do you obey it? Yes, they obeyed the external requirements of the law. They, <laughs> sorry. They were so particular about the ceremonial cleanliness. They were so meticulous, even tightening their table spices. They fasted and prayed at stipulated times. But the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked them. Because while they honored God with their lips, their hearts were so far from God. They knew the commandments of God, but they just kept those that could be seen by the people so that they would look spiritual. They didn't seek to please God from their hearts. Hypocrisy, brothers and sisters in Christ, is all about maintaining outward appearances with no regard to obedience from the heart and Paul is pointing out here the problem of the misunderstanding of the law and its demands the demands of the law were strict and exacting and in fact apart from God's grace the law would condemn us and he is pointing to two realities that the Jews ignored one the law is the pattern for righteousness and second, the Lord drives to drive them to Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we miss either one of the two, <coughs> then we would precisely what happened to God's people in, in, in Paul's time will happen to us. We will become immune to the sense of the need of grace. That's why I always tell the men in our fellowship, you know, the problem that they're teaching now, they, we, they, they want us to know that we are saints, and they want to ignore that we are sinners. And when you do that, you lose that sense of the grace of God. And to put this on a level where we can all understand, imagine for a minute a person was born in a Christian home. He was raised in the church. He attends Sunday school. He is surrounded by Christian things. He sings Christian songs. He hears Christian sermons. Perhaps he reads the Bible. He participates in the rituals. Uh, every Sunday, he takes the Lord's Supper. But his life hasn't been changed. He hasn't been transformed. Now, if he is not careful, he will begin to think that because of these privileges, He's already qualified. Automatically, he's a Christian. Again, nothing could be farther from the truth. That's why we always, we always remind you. Perhaps you go to church every Sunday. Perhaps your parents are strong Christians. Perhaps you read the Bible. But if you don't obey what you're reading... If you don't apply the truth in your life, if your life hasn't been changed, and there is no hatred for sin, and you're not growing in holiness, SF, SF. can you look at the person beside you? What you know will all be held against you if it is not believed and practiced in your life. And then they boast in God. Paul says, you boast in God. Again, this is a good thing to do in and of itself. Remember Jeremiah 9, 23, 24? Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So boasting in the Lord is good. Listen, if our aim is to glorify Him, to give glory to Him for our salvation. But Paul's Jewish uh, readers at that time were boasting in God in the sense that they elevate themselves higher 
or above the Gentiles. It was a form of spiritual pride. They are saying, we know the only one and true God. And you, you don't. That's why we are the true children of God. And sometimes, you know, if we're not careful, we're also guilty of that. You know, the Bible that we use is the only approved Bible in heaven. That's the King James Version. And you're using NIV and, and other, that's demonic. The same. You know, our baptism is the right one because we are immersed, including our wallet. But you, it's we seek, it's stabo. I remember my wife, you know, the first time that she was baptized in front of the congregation. It's just like an ice bucket challenge. A pail of water was poured on her. And Pastor Louis said, ah, 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 we have to rebaptize her. Diba? We, we, we take pride in that. Or perhaps there are people who, who speak in tongues. And you say, oh, they are weak, demonic, again. You know, when, when we talk about non-essentials, again, when we talk about non-essentials, there must be, you know, a room for that, that we won't debate with them. But when you talk about essentials, when you talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the, the, uh, he's a man God, and they say that he is only man, then we all stand to the truth. Because all heresies, all errors, militate the on. It's a wrong uh, recognition or wrong doctrine of Jesus Christ. We are guilty when we think of ourselves that we are better than them when we talk about non-essentials. And then Paul says in verse 18, And know his will and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law. Again, these are good things in and of themselves. We should be diligent to study God's word so that we would know his will. His word teaches us discernment so that we can approve the things that are excellent, the things that are essential. In the commentary of Charles Hodge on the book of Romans, he said, it was not their moral judgments, but their moral conduct that was in fault. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is good to be instructed in the law, the word of God. Biblical and theological knowledge is a good thing because it helps us to grow and to know God and his ways as revealed in the word. But the goal of understanding theology it's not to win the argument. It's not to win the debate. It's not to impress others of our knowledge, of our great knowledge. Rather, it should humble our hearts before God that we would worship Him more fervently, that we would obey Him more thoroughly. And that is the reason why we do that. Now, next, may I, may I again challenge you? Next year, we are still going to uh, uh, have a theological class Right, and it will start January 20. I think it's January 20. You know, the very reason why we want you to know mo Him more is that you have to worship Him more. To obey Him more. And then, their leadership in verses 19 to 20. The Jews think that He is a guide to the blind. He is an instructor. He is a teacher. He is the light in darkness. And these four things, brothers and sisters in Christ, say about the Jews' self-perception, about the way they relate to the Gentiles. And those are pretty heavy claims to, claim, to, to, to make for yourself. And no, notice with me, Paul never contradicted them. All of them are good if they are used in the right way. After all, the blind needs a guide. Foolish people certainly need instructors. And immature believers or infants need teachers. And that's what the Jews claim to be. Their claim, brothers and sisters in Christ, was respectable. But their performance was not. Hypocrisy not only keeps us from hearing the gospel... But it leads us to have an attitude of inappropriate pride and superiority to our neighbor. Paul says, you are convinced that you are a guide to the blind. Actually, this is a responsibility that God has given them. You are the light 
Jews are in the light, Gentiles are in darkness. This is a responsibility that God has given them, that they will be the light among the nations. They will open a blind eyes in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 6 to 7. God has called them to be a blessing to the Gentiles. But what Paul is saying, you have distorted the truth. You have a responsibility that God has given you, but you become so proud. And instead of seeing the responsibility and bear obligation to the Gentiles, they became spiritually lazy and spiritually proud. And he goes on, he says, you are convinced that you are the instructor to the fullest, that you are well equipped to be the teachers of immature believers. Rightly so. But again, they became so proud that they didn't see the holes in their life. They didn't see their errors and their mistakes. That's why Paul was telling them, because they believe that they have arrived. Spiritually and morally, the Jews believe that they are a cat above everyone else. And that is hypocrisy, Paul is saying. Everyone who teaches the word of God, even here in the church, must first apply it to himself. May I repeat that? Everyone who teaches God's word must first apply it to himself. Because knowledge without obedience puffs up, us up with pride, which is the root of hypocrisy. Spiritually proud hypocrites who have lots of knowledge but don't obey, they will always look down on the blind, the foolish, and the immature that they teach. But when you apply this truth to you first, you will be humbled because you'll realize that if God hadn't shed His light on you, you too will still be, would still be in the dark. A pastor once said, preaching is a risky occupation. Tama ba, Pastor Rene and the pastors here? You, you, you aim your biblical darts to the congregation, intending to hit him, them in the areas where they need to change. And then you discover. Remember, Pastor Rene, when he spoke last Sunday, he said, you know, I rehearsed this, I practiced this, but I'm nervous. Because it is not only a dart. The Word of God is not only a dart for a preacher. It's a boomerang. It comes back to us and clobbers us to see how we need to change before we teach others, we need to apply the word of God to our own hearts. And that's how Paul confronts the teachers in verses 21 to 22. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Paul goes on, or Paul goes right to their self-perceived strengths. These areas, are you going to tell me these are the things that you are going to offer to God? You are hypocrites. You are sinners. Paul didn't say, you know, your problem is that you've got a corner on the truth. Your problem is that you impose morality on everyone else. That's not what he said. In fact, he said, you're right. You have a corner on the truth. You have a corner on the right morality, that God's morality should be imposed upon the world. But what I am saying, you are inconsistent. You are not living according to the word that you teach. And that's the problem. What you profess, you don't walk your talk. That's what Paul is telling them. You're right, God has chosen you to be a witness among the nations of His truth by living according to it. The law was given to you. But you have to apply the truth in your life. And that's the problem with the Jews. Inconsistency between profession and practice is the proof of their sin. And it is also a proof of their judgment. It is also a proof that they need the grace of God. And that's what Paul is saying. So to summarize that, Paul is saying that Hypocrisy misleads the hypocrite because he knows the truth, but he doesn't apply it in his life. He doesn't obey it on the heart level. He feeds 
his knowledge feeds his pride rather than humble him. He doesn't examine his own heart. He doesn't teach his heart. Hypocrisy not only misleads the hypocrite, it also messes up unbelievers. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. And, <coughs> sorry, this is a quotation from Isaiah 52 verse 5, where because of Israel's sin, the nation of Israel was destroyed and the people were led to captivity. Because of their sin, the, the, the Gentiles mocked their God who was not in their minds able to rescue them. But the real cause of their captivity was not God's inability to rescue them, but because of their disobedience to Him. And it made their God look bad. And Paul is saying, you claim to be a teacher, you claim to be an instructor, you claim to be a light, you claim to be a guide. But because of your hypocrisy, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. Blasphemy was the ultimate because it involved deliberately dragging the name of God in the mud. And that's what the Jews were doing by saying one thing and doing another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the point is this. If we tell others that we are Christians, but we live in disobedience to Him, then Christians or non-Christians or unbelievers will mock the Christian faith. If a professing Christian is dishonest in his business, if a professing Christian is immoral in his personal life, if a professing Christian is abusive to his family, what will the world say? Why follow their God? Who needs that kind of life? The only difference that we have with them is that they go to church more often than us. That's a problem. And while God is sovereign in saving His elect, humanly speaking, a sinning Christian or a Christian living in sin keeps a needy sinner from the only good news that can save him. We were supposed to be the light to those in the dark, but we too were in the dark. Have you heard the conversation that goes like this? Brad, I haven't seen you go to SM or FT or Rob. And the guy says, you know, I don't go to those establishments because they are full of hypocrites. Have you heard a conversation like that? But I'm sure most of you have heard, I don't want to go to that church because it is full of hypocrites. There is nothing that turns people off more than someone who says he is a Christian, who professes to be a Christian, but his lifestyle, his conduct, his behavior denies it. Someone once said to Charles Spurgeon, the great English preacher of the last century, the Bible is the light of the world. And Spurgeon objected, saying, how can that be? The world never reads the Bible. And he went on to say, the Bible is the light of the church. And the church is the light of the world. The world reads the Christian, not the Bible. Brothers and sisters in Christ, just as we can learn a bit about an earthly father by watching his children, the world learns about our heavenly father by watching his children. What do your friends discover when they read your life? If we monitor you 24-7, for three days only, does your life point to people, point people to the Savior? Or does your life cause people to blaspheme the holy name of God? You know, we may well be the only Bible that those in the world around us ever read. Our lives should make them want to know our God. That every time that when we go out of this place, when people see us, they would say, He has really fellowship with God. And I want to know His God. Can you say 
that when people look at you and see you, they really want to know God. There is that excitement. Or, Cristiano Bayan? Is that what they're going to say? Lastly, hypocrisy maligns God. You who boast in the law, so you're breaking the law, do you dishonor God? Now, verse 23 may be a rhetorical statement, or it can be read as a statement. A rhetorical question, I say. This is the root sin of all sin. To dishonor, or to, dis to, to, to not glorify God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21, we have studied this. The Jews cheered on Paul when he dieted the Gentiles for not giving glory to God, for not giving thanks to God. But here in our passage, Paul brings the same charge against the Jews. You see, God chose Israel. God chose Israel to be a glory to Him. But by their disobedience, they dishonored God. You know, in the same way, God chose you and me to be the praise of the glory of His grace. You get that? God has chosen you to be the praise of the glory of His grace. And when we disobey God, when we disobey His word, we dishonor Him. We dishonor Him. Well, I know, sometimes living in obedience to God's word is presented as a path to a blessing. And it is. You see, if we obey God's word, by loving our wife as Christ loved the church. Again, I always say this, I always say this in the pulpit. Whenever a couple comes to us, we always tell, uh, Namatay ka na ba sa cruz? Para iwanan mo yung asawa mo? No. The word says, you have to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And if you also are consistent in giving grace and goodness and kindness to your children, then we would be blessed with happy families. That's true. God knows what is best for us in obedience to His word brings blessing. And the opposite is also true. Disobedience brings pain and trouble. But listen, the main reason we should want to obey God is not for us to be blessed, but rather to honor Him. That is the reason when we read the Word of God and apply the truth in our life, because I want to glorify Him. I want to worship Him. I want to honor Him. And the reason that I am so afraid to disobey Him is that because I don't want to dishonor the glorious name of God. He is infinitely worthy of all our praise, of all our worship, of our honor and glory. So we should fear the sin of hypocrisy, of putting a veneer over <coughs> our disobedience, over our disobedient hearts, because we don't want to dishonor the all-glorious God who saved us for His glory. When professing Christian believers claim to be followers of Christ and they live in contradiction of that profession, they become the single greatest hindrance to the gospel. The greatest hindrance to the spread of the gospel is not that the Bible hasn't been translated to every language. It is not that we don't have enough missionaries amongst every people group. To paraphrase what John Piper said, the greatest single hindrance to the cause of the gospel today is nominal Christianity, hypocrisy, false believers, people who claim to be believers but who do not give any evidence whatsoever of the reality of that claim. And that's the reality gap. You are saying this thing, but you are doing another thing. The single biggest obstacle to evangelism is hypocrisy. And the single greatest impediment to the spread of the gospel today is the nominal Christian. 
Can you look at the person beside you? Hypocrite pa. As I, as I end, let me give or share with you two things. There are so many because my time is kulang na. How do we overcome the deception of hypocrisy? First, you find an accountability group. Find a few people with whom you can be completely honest. People who will commit to love you enough to tell you, to rebuke you, to take the mask off because you're again putting those masks, putting those masks on. A group where you each can do what James says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. We need people who will affirm us for the person that God has made us to be. And I would like to take this time to invite you to attend the uh, married men here, to attend the men's Bible, uh, men's fellowship every Saturday. That's 7 to 9 a.m. You know, in that group, for three Saturdays, we study the Word of God. And then on the last Sunday, we ask questions. And we all talk about our struggles. We talk about our weaknesses. And for the three months that I've been with them, wala pa naman ako naririnig na nag-gossip. Hindi pa lumalabas ang problema ko. But you know, we need people who will help us. Who will walk the extra mile to pray for us. And when we stumble, they will be there to lift us up, not to condemn us. They will pray for us. They will encourage us. They will cheer us. They will clap when we make small steps of victory. Look for people whom you can trust so that your struggles and weaknesses can be dealt with. And then last... <coughs> Or lastly, a transformational Bible study. In other words, we must study the Word of God, but not just to gain information. We have to apply the truths to our daily lives such that we are changed. And that is also the reason why for this year, we taught you how to read the Word, how to interpret the Word of God. Because when you're alone, when you're on your uh, personal devotion, you can have... Uh, as you rightly divide the word and as you understand it, you can rightly understand it, you can apply it to your life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we read and meditate and ponder on those verses, aim at applying it personally. Ask yourself, so what? How am I supposed to live in light of this text? And if you struggle with anger, with lust, or with greed, memorize relevant verses. In the men's fellowship, we have memorized Philippians 4.8. That is our verse. Whenever we're tempted, whenever we are uh, having a struggle, we always think and, me and, and recite from memory Philippians 4.8. You can ask Brother Joseph later. Huh? Brothers and sisters in Christ, do not let the sin of hypocrisy mislead you. Do not let the sin of hypocrisy mess up unbelievers. And do not let the sin of hypocrisy malign our glorious God. Let us pray, our Lord, Heavenly Father, as we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, when we stop and contemplate the darkness of our hearts, really all of us shudder at the reality of hypocrisy. But what can we do? but to run, Lord, to the cross. To run to Christ and cast ourselves, Lord, at His feet and beg for Your mercy. And that by Your grace, Lord, You would draw us to a vital relationship with You. So that it would change our lives, our priorities, our standing with You. Thank you. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.